Hello, my name is Seti Puspitasari and this is my listening assignment, MIT-4. Hmm. Number one, um, on the table, um, event left London. Time, um, in 1914, descriptions about the event, uh, with a crew of 29 men and 69, 69 sled dogs and a cat. Number two, ship frozen in ice on January nine, January eighteenth, nineteen fourteen. Shackleton, Shackleton believed that they could reach the Antarctic continent despite the ice. He was wrong about the, about this, however, and on January eighteenth, nineteen fourteen, as the endurance approached. Antarctica it became stuck in the ice. It couldn't go anywhere. The crew stayed on the ship, which floated along with the ice for more than 10 months during that. Number three, started for South Pole, 1,700 miles round trip on 1914, 20th century. Shackleton's trips Shackleton's trip in especially interesting because his goal was to be the first person to walk to across the continent of Antarctica. Also, you will find out that this trip was also special because of the problem and difficulties that Shackleton and his crew endured, endured along the way. In fact, this is interesting Shackleton made his trip to Antarctica on a ship called the Endurance. It's almost as if he somehow knew about the difficult events to come. Let's begin in England. The Endurance left London in 1914 with a crew of 29 men, 69 sled dogs, and a cat. After stopping in Argentina, the ship proceeded to South Georgia, an island about 800 miles from Antarctica. Then, on December 5, 1914, the Endurance left South Georgia and right away, the ship entered water that was filled with ice. However, despite the dangers, Shackleton and his crew proceeded on their journey. Number 3. Traveled Overland On October 25, 7th, 1914. On October 27th, 1914, ni sorry, October 27th, uh, 1915. On October 27th, 1915, Shackleton ordered the crew to leave the Endurance. They took food and other supplies, including three smaller boats of the ship and set up camp on a large piece of floating ice. This turned out to be good decisions because just a month later they watched as their ship was crushed by the ice and sank sank under the, the water. The water. Number five ninety seven miles from South Pole turn around not enough food. April ninth 1916. Finally, in April of 1916, the crew saw a land. It was elephant land, which was about 100 miles away. They knew that the ice below them was getting thinner and might be break might break at any time. So they decided to proceed to the island. So on April on April 9th, 1916. Shackleton and his crew got into the three small boats. They rescued from the endurance, from the endurance before it sank. They pulled all their supplies in the boat and began to, the journey to Elephant Island. It took seven days to get there. To get there, the journey was terrible, and they almost died. They all almost died. Make a note. And retell the story using your own word admin information from the audio. I make the note uh, with the um, red, red, 
word, red color of word, and the other color of word. That is the note I made. I made. Speaker, good afternoon. Please take your seat. I love to discuss today. Today, I'm going to talk about one of the greatest adventures of the, t of the 20th century, Ernest Shackleton's trip to Antarctica. Now, there are other explorers who have been to Antarctica, but Shackleton's trip is especially interesting because his goal was to be the first person to walk to across the continent of Antarctica. Also, you'll find out this trip was also special because of the problems and difficulties that Shackleton and his crew endured, endured along the way. In fact, this is interesting. Shackleton made his trip to Antarctica on a ship called the Endurance. It's almost as if he somehow knew about the difficult events to come. Let's begin in England. The Endurance left London in 1914. With a crew of 29 men, 69 sled dogs, and a cat. After stopping in Argentina, the ship proceeded to South Georgia as island about 800 miles from Antarctica. Then on December 5th, 1914, the Endurance left South Georgia and right away the ship entered water that was filled with ice. However, despite the dangers, Shackleton and his crew proceeded on their journey. Shackleton believed that they could reach the Antarctic continent despite the ice. He was wrong about this, however. And on January 18, 1915, as the Endurance approached Antarctica, it became stuck in the ice. It couldn't go anywhere. The crew stayed on the ship, which floated along with the ice for more than 10 months. During that time, the crew lived on the ship, although, although they could go down on the ice and walk around if it was not too cold. On October 27, 1915, Shackleton ordered the crew to leave the Endurance. They took food and other supplies, including three smaller boats of the ship, and set up camp on a large piece of floating ice. This turned out to be good decisions, because just a month, just a month later, they watched as their ship was crushed by the ice and sank under the water. So, is everyone with me so far? Any question? Okay, let's then let's continue. For the next six months, the crew of the Endurance lived on the floating around the edge of Antarctica. They ate the food from the ship, but when that was gone, they hunt animals in the area and finally hit and ate their dogs. Finally, in April, on April of 1916, the crew saw land. It was a island, which was about 100 miles away. They knew that the ice below them was getting thinner and might break, might break at any time. So they decided to proceed to the island. So on April 9th, 1916, Shackleton and his crew got into the three small boats. They rescued from the endurance before it sank. They put all their supplies in the boats and began the journey to the to Eleven Island. It took seven days to get there. The journey was terrible and they all almost died. So, now the crew was on land but there was no hope that they would be rescued from Eleven Island. Eleven Island. It was too far from anything. The nearest people were on South Georgia Island, over 800 miles away. Despite the danger, Shackleton decide, decided to go south 
to go to South Georgia. He knew, he knew it was their only hope for rescue. So, on April 24, 1916, Shackleton and five men left in one of the boats to try to get to South Georgia. Twenty men stayed on Island. After 17 days, in stormy seas, Shackleton and his men reached South Georgia. But they weren't finished yet. They had to walk for 36 hours to reach the walling station. Finally, on May 20, they reached the wheelers. But, remembered, Shackleton still had to rescue his men on 11th Island. This took more than three months. Three, three ships tried to get the, to 11th Island, but they couldn't get there because of, of all the ice. Finally, on August 30, 1916, 22 months after they left on their journey, Shackleton rescued his men. Amazingly, amazingly, everyone on the island was alive and they were all rescued. It's hard to believe, isn't it? As you see, this is an important and this is an important and interesting example of explorations from the last century. Part two decided decide the statement is true or false. If there is false statement, you have to fix the statement. First, Aladdin comes from a sailor family. False. Taylor family, the right statement. Taylor from the Taylor family, the right statement. Is there a statement? Number two, the magician's name is Mustafa. False. Actually, that is the name of Aladdin's father. The magicians only called by Africans magicians or the magicians. Three, the genies, the genie, comes out from the cave. Holes. The genie comes. The genie comes out from the ring and the lamp. <laughs> Number four. The name of Aladdin's mother is Fatima. False. Fatima is a is a pious woman actually. Make a note and write the story using your open words. Add many information from the audio. The note is the word with color. The story of Aladdin is one of the most familiar narratives in all of literature classic Rex to Rich. Rex to Riches. There once lived a poor tailor who has a son called Aladdin, a careless, Idle boy who would do nothing but play ball all day long. In the streets was a little idle boy like himself. This so grieved the father that he died. Yet, in spite of his mother's tears and prayers, Aladdin did not mend his way. One day, when he was playing in the street as usual, a stranger asked him his age. And if he was not the son of Mustafa, the tailor, I am, sir, replied Aladdin, but he died a long while ago on the stranger who was a famous African magician, fell on his neck and kissed him, saying, I am your uncle and knew your knew your and knew you from your likeness to my brother. Go to your mother and tell her i am coming i am coming aladdin ran home and told his mother of his newly found uncle indeed child said she said your father had a brother but i always thought he was dead however she preferred supper and bade aladdin seek his uncle who came laden with wine and fruit he presently fell down and kissed the place where Mustafa used to sit. 
bidding Aladdin's mother not to be surprised at not having seen him before, as he had been 40 years out of the country. He, he then turned to Aladdin and asked him his threat, at which the boy hung his head, while his mother burst into, ter into tears. On learning... On learning the, uh, that Aladdin was idle and would learn no trade, he offered to take a shop for him and stock it with merchandise, 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 merchandise. Next day, he bought Aladdin a fine suit of clothes and took him all over the city, showing him the sight and broke him home at nightfall to his mother who was overjoyed to see her son so fine. The next day, the magician led Aladdin into some beautiful gardens a long way outside the city gates. They sat down by a fountain and the magician pulled a cake from his girdle, which he divided between them. Between them. They then journeyed onward till they almost reached the mountains. Aladdin was tired that he begged to go back, but the magician beguiled him with pleasant stories and led him on in spite of himself. At last, they came of two mountains divided by a narrow valley. We will go no farther, said the false uncle. I will show you something wonderful. Only do your gather up sticks while I kindle a fire. When it was lit, the magician threw on the on it a powder he had about him, at the same time saying some magical magical words. The earth trembled a little and opened in front of them, disclosing a square flat stone with a brass ring in the middle to raise it by. Aladdin tried to run away, but the magician caught him and gave him a blow that knocked him down. What have I done, uncle? Uncle, he said piteously. Whereupon the magician, magician said more kindly, Fear nothing, but obey me. Beneath this stone lies a treasure which is to be yours, and no one else may touch it. So you must do exactly as I tell you. At the word, eh, at the word, treasures Aladdin forgot his fears, his fears, and grasped the ring as he was told, saying the names of his father and grandfather. The stone came up quickly, quite e easily, and some steps appeared. Go down, said the magician. At the foot of those steps you will find an open door leading into three large halls. Tuck up your gun and go through them without touching anything, or you will die instantly. These halls lead into a garden of fine fruit trees. Walk on until you come to a neat, neat in a terrace where stands a light lamp. Pour out the oils it contains and bring it to me. He drew a ring from his finger and gave it to Aladdin, bidding him prosper. Aladdin found everything as the magician had said, gather some fruits of the trees, and having got the lamp, arrived at the mouth of the cave. The magician cried out in a great hurry, make haste and give me the lamp. This Aladdin refused to do until he was out of the cave. The magician flew into a terrible patience and throwing some more powder onto the fire. He said something and the stone rolled back into its place. The magician left Persia forever, which finally showed that he was no uncle of Aladdin's, but a cunning magician who had read in his magic books of a wonderful, wonderful land, which would make him the most powerful man in the world.
though he alone knew where to find it. He could only re receive it from the hand of another. He had picked out of picked out the police Aladdin for this purpose, intending to get the lamp and kill him afterward. For two days, Aladdin remained in the dark, crying and lamenting. At least he clasped his hands and in prayers, and in so doing, doing wrapped the ring, which the magician had forgotten to take from him. Immediately, an enormous and frightful genie rose out of the earth, saying, What would you do with me? I am the slave of the ring, and will obey thee in all things. And will obey thee in all things. Aladdin fiercely replied, Deliver me from this place, whereupon the earth opened, and he found himself outside. As soon as his eyes could bear the light, he went home, but fainted on the threshold. When he came to himself, he told his mother what had passed and showed her the lamb, the and the fruits he had gathered, gathered in the garden, which were in reality precious stones. He then He then asked for some food. Alas, child, he said, she said, I have nothing in the house, but I have spun a little cotton and will go and sell it. Aladdin bade her keep her cotton, for he would sell the lamb instead. As it was very dirty, she began to rub it, that it might fetch a higher price. Instantly, a high dose a high dose genie appeared and asked what she would have. She fainted away, but Aladdin, snatching the lamb, said boldly, Fetch me something to eat. The genie returned with a silver bowl, twelve silver plates containing rich meat, two silver cups, and two bottles of wine. Aladdin's mother, when she came to herself, said, Whence comes this splendid feast? Ask not but it, replied Aladdin. So they sat at breakfast till it was dinner time, and Aladdin told his mother about the lamb. She begged him to sell it and have nothing to do with the devils. With devils. No, said Aladdin, since Chen had made us aware of its virtues, we will use it and the ring likewise which I shall always wear on my finger. When they had eaten all the genie had brought, Aladdin sold one of the silver splits, so on and so on until none were left. He then had recourse to the genie, who gave him another set of plates and thus they, they lived for many years. One day, Aladdin heard an order from the Sultan's proclaims that everyone was to stay at home and close his shutters while the princess, his daughter, went to and from the bed. Aladdin was his sight, and a desire by a desire to see her face, which was very difficult, as she always when failed. He did himself behind the door of the bed and peeped through a chink. The princess lifted her veil as she went in, and looked so beautiful that Aladdin fell in love with her at first sight. He went home so changed that his mother was frightened. He told her he loved the princess so deeply that he could not live without her, and meant to, to ask her in marriage of her father. His mother, on hearing this, burst out laughing. But Aladdin at least prevailed upon her to go before the Sultan and carry his request. She fetched a napkin and light in this uh, in it the magic fruits from the enchanted garden, which sparkled and shone like 
the most beautiful jewels. She took dust with her to please the sultan and set out trusting in the lamb. The grand vizier and the lord of council had just gone and had just gone in as she entered the hall, the hall and placed herself in front of the sultan. He, however, took no notice of her. She went every day for a week and stood in the same place. When the council broke up of the sixth day, the sultan said to, the, to his vizier, I see a certain woman in the audience chamber, every day carrying something in a napkin. Call her next time, that I may find out what she wants. Next day, at a sign from the vizier, she went up to the foot of the turn and remain kneeling till the sultan said to her rise good woman and tell me what you want she hesitated so the sultan sent away all but the vizier and bade her speak frankly promising to forgive her beforehand for anything she might have say she then told him of her son's violent love for the princess I prayed him to forget her, she said, but in vain he threatened to do some desperate deed if I refused to go and ask you, your majesty for the hand of the princess. Now I pray you to forgive not me alone, but my son Aladdin. The sultan asked her kindly what she had in napkin, where you found she unfolded the jewels and presented him presented them. He was thunderstruck, and turning to the vizier, said, What says thou, ought I not to bestow the princess on one who values her at such price? The vizier, who wants her for his own son, begged the sultan to withhold her for three months, in, in the course of which he hoped his son would contrive to make him a richer person. The Sultan granted this and told Aladdin's mother that to be, con to be consented to be married, she must not appear before him again for three months. Aladdin waited patiently for nearly three months. But after two had elapsed, his mother, going into the city to buy oil, found every one rejoicing, and asked what was going on. Do you not know? Was the answer that the son of the grand vizier is to marry the sultan's daughter tonight. Breathless, she ran and told Aladdin, who was over overwhelmed at first, but presently bad though him of the lamb he rubbed it and the genie appeared and say saying what what is thy will aladdin replied the sultan as thou knowest he broken his promise to me and the vizier's sons is to have the princess my comment is that tonight you bring hither the bridge and bridge and bridge groom master I obey, said the genie. Aladdin then went to his chamber, where sure enough, at midnight, at the genie, transport the bed containing the vizier's sons and the princess. Take this new married man, he said, and put him outside in a coat, and return, return at, that, at daybreak, whereupon the genie took the vizier's sons out of bed, leaving Aladdin with the princess. Fear nothing, Aladdin said to her. You are my wife, promised to me by your unjust father, and no harm shall come to you. The princess was too frightened to speak, and passed the most miserable night of her life, while Aladdin lay down beside her and slept soundly. At the appointed hour, the genie pet in the seafaring bedroom, light him in his place and transport the bed back to the place to the palace presently 
The Sultan came to wish his daughter good morning. The unhappy vizier sons jumped up and hid himself, while the princess would not say a word, and was very sorrowful. The Sultan sent her mother, sent her, her mother to her, who said, "How comes it, child, that you will not speak to your father? What has happened?" The princess sighed deeply and at last told her mother how, during the night, the bed had been carried into some strange house, and what had passed there. Her mother did not believe her in the least, in, in the least, but bade her rise and consider it an idle dream. The following night, exactly the same thing happened, and the more and the next morning, on the princess refusal to speak. The sultan threatened to cut off her head. She then confessed all, bidding him to ask the vizier's son if it were not so. The sultan told the vizier to ask his son, who owned the truth, adding that, dearly as he loved the princess, he had rather die than go through another such fearful night and wish to be separated from her. His wish was granted, and there was an end to feasting and rejoicing. When the three months were over, Aladdin sent his mother to remind the Sultan of his promise. She stood in the same place as before, and the Sultan, who had forgotten Aladdin, at once remembered him and sent for her. On seeing her poverty, the Sultan felt less inclined that then ever to keep his word, and asked his vizier's advice, who consulted him to set so high a value on the princess that no man living could come up to it. The sultan then turned to Aladdin's mother, saying, Good woman, a sultan must remember his promise, and I will remember mine, but your son must first send me forty basins of gold brimful of jewels carried by forty black slaves, laid by, by as many white ones, splendid dress, tell him that I await his answer. The mother of Aladdin bowed low and went home, thinking all was lost. She gave Aladdin the message, adding, adding, he may wait long enough for your answer. Not so long, mother, as you think, her son replied. I would do a great deal more than that, that for the princess. He summoned the genie. In a few moments, and in a few moments, the eighty slave arrived and filled up the small house and garden. Aladdin made them set out of the to the palace, two and two, followed by his mother. They were so richly dressed with such splendid jewels in their girdles, that everyone crowded to see them and the basins of gold that they carried on their heads. They entered the palace, and after kneeling before the sultan, stood in a half circle around the throne with their arms crossed, while Aladdin's mother presented them to the sultan. He hesitated not longer, but said, Good woman, Return and tell your son that I wait. I wait for him with open arms. She lost no time in telling Aladdin, bidding him make haste. But Aladdin first called the genie. I want a scanted bath. I want a scanted bath, he said. A richly embroidered, embroidered habit, a horse surpassing the sultan's, and twenty slaves to attend me. Beside this, six slaves beautiful dress to wait on my mother, and lastly, ten thousand pieces of gold in ten purses. No sooner said than done. Aladdin mounted his horse and passed through the streets, the slaves throwing gold as they won. They went. Those who had played with him in his childhood knew him not. He had grown so handsome. When the sultan saw him, he came down for, from his turn. 
from his throne, embraced him, and led him into a hall where a feast was spread, intending to marry him on the princess at that very day. But Aladdin refused, saying, I must build a palace fit for her, and took his leave. Once home, he said to the genie, Build me a palace that of the finest marble, set with jasper, agate, and other precious stones. In the middle, you shall build me a large hall with a dome, its four, its, its four walls of messy gold and silver. It's having six windows, whose lattice, all except one which is to be left unfinished, must be set with diamond and rubies. And rubies. There must be stables and horses and grooms and slaves. Go and see about it. The palace was finished by the next day, and the genie carried him there and show him all his orders faithfully carried out even the laying of a velvet carpet from aladdin's palace to the sultan's palace to the sultan's aladdin's mother then dresses herself carefully and walks to the palace with her slaves while he followed her on horseback the sultan sent musicians with trumpets and cymbals to meet them, so that the air resounded with music and cheers. She was taken to the princess, who saluted her and treated her with a great honor. At night, the princess said goodbye, goodbye to her father and set out on the carpet for Aladdin Palace, with his mother at her side, and followed by the hundred slaves. She was charmed at the sight of Aladdin, who ran to receive her. Princess, he said, blame your beauty for my boldness if I have displaced you. She told him that, having seen him, she willing obeyed her father in this matter. After the wedding had taken place, Aladdin led her into the hall, where a feast was spread, and she supped with him. And after which they danced till midnight. Next day, Aladdin invited the Sultan to see the palace. On entering the hall, with the four and twenty windows, with the rubies, diamonds, and emerald, he cried. He cried, "It, it is a world wonder. It's a world wonder. There is only one thing that surprised me." Was it by accident that one window was left unfinished? No, sir, by design, returned Aladdin. I wish your majesty to have the glory of finishing this palace. The sultan was pleased, pleased and sent for the best two jewelers in the city. He showed them the unfinished window and bade them fit, up, fit it up like the others. Sir, I replied, their spokesman. We cannot find jewels enough. The sultans had his own page, which they soon used, but to no purpose. For in what for in a month's time the work was no half done. Aladdin knowing that their task was fain, bade them undo their work and carry the jewels back. And the genie finished the window at his command. The Sultan was surprised to receive his jewels again and visit Aladdin, who sold him the window finished. The Sultan embraced him, and the envious vizier meanwhile hinting that it was the work of an enchantment. Aladdin had won the hearts of the people, people by his gentle bearing. He was made captain of the Sultan's armies, and won several battles for him but remained modest and courteous as before and lived thus in peace content and content for several years. But far away in Africa, the magician remembered Aladdin and by his magic arts discovered that Aladdin, instead of perishing miserable, 
in the cave, had escaped, and had married a princess, with whom he was living in a great honor and wealth. He knew that the poor tailor's son could only have accomplished this by means of the lamp and traveled night and day until he reached the capitals of China, bent on Aladdin, Aladdin's room. As he passed through the day, he heard people, people talking everywhere about a marvelous, marvelous palace. Forgive my ignorance, he asked. What is this palace you speak of? Have you not heard of Prince Aladdin's palace? Was the reply. The greatest wonder of the world. I will direct you if you have a mind to see it. The magician thanked him who spoke, and having seen the palace, knew that it had been raised by the genie of the lamp, and became half mad with rage. He determined to get hold of the lamp, and again plunged Aladdin into the deepest world poverty. Unlucky, Aladdin had gone a hunting for eight days, which gave the magician plenty of time. He of a dozen he bought a dozen copper lamps, put them into a basket, and went to the palace, crying, New lamps for old, followed by a jeering crowd. The princess, sitting in the hall of four day and twenty windows, sent a half to find out what the noise was about, who came, who came back laughing, so that the princess called at her. Madam, replied the slave, who can help loving to see an old fool offering to eggtings fine new lamps for old ones? Another slave hearing this said, There is an old one on the cornice, there which he can have. Now this was the magic lamp, which Aladdin had left there, as he could not take it out hunting with him. The princess, not knowing its value, lovingly bade the, the slave take it and make the exchange. She went and said to the magician, Give me a new line for this. She, he snatched it and bade the slave take her choice amid the tears of the crowd. Little he cared, but left of crying his lambs, and went out of the city gates to a lonely pelt place where he remained till nightfall when he pulled out the lime and rubbed it the genie appeared and the maid and at the magician's command carried him together with the palace and the princess in it to a lonely place in africa next morning the sultan looked out of the window towards aladdin palace and rubbed his eyes or it was gone. He sent for the viziers and asked what had become of the palace. The viziers looked out, looked out too, and was lost in astonishment. He again put it down to an henchman, and this time the sultan believed him and sent thirty men on horseback to fetch Aladdin in chains. They made him riding, riding home, bound him, and forced him to go with them on foot. The people, however, who loved him, who loved him, followed, armed, to see that he came to no harm. He was carried before the sultan, who orders the execution executioner to cut off his head. The executioner made Aladdin kneel, kneel down, bandaged his eyes, and raised his scimitar to strike. At that instant, the vizier, who saw that the crowd had forced their way into the courtyard and were scaling the walls to rescue Aladdin, called to the ex executioner to stay his hand. The people, indeed, looked so threatening that the sultan gave way and ordered Aladdin to, to be unbound and pardoned him in the sight of the crowd. Aladdin now begged to know what he had done. False word, false wretch, said Sultan. 
come tinter and showed him from the window place the place where his place had stood. Aladdin was so amazed that he could not say a word. Where is my palace and my daughter? demanded the sultan. For the first, I am not so deeply concerned, but my daughter I must have, and you must find her or lose your head. Aladdin begged for forty days in which to find her, promising if he failed to return and suffer death at the sultan's pleasure. His prayers were granted, and he went forth sadly from the sultan's presence. For three days he wandered about like a mad a madman, asking everyone what had become of his palace, but they only laughed and pitied him. He came to the banks of a river, of a river, and knelt down to say his prayers before throwing himself in. In so doing, in so doing, he rubbed the magic ring he still wore. The genie had he had seen in the Gave appeared and asked his will. Save my life, genie," said Aladdin. "Bring my palace back." "That is not in my power," said the genie. "I'm only the slave of the ring. You must ask him of the lamb." "Even so," Aladdin said. "Aladdin, but thou canst take me to the palace and set me down under my dear wife, wife's window." He at once found himself in Africa, under the window of the princess, and fell asleep out of sheer weariness. He was awake, awakened by the singing of the birds, and his heart was lighter. He saw plainly that all his misfortune were, were owing of, to the loss of the lamb, and finally wondered who had robbed him of it. That morning, the princess rose earlier than she had done since she had been carried carried to, into Africa by the magician, whose company she was forced to endure to endure once a day. She, however, treated him so harshly that he dared not leave there altogether. As she was dressing. One of her women looked out and saw Aladdin. The princess ran and opened the window, and at the noise she made, Aladdin looked up. She called to him to come to her, and great was the joy of these lovers at seeing each other again. After he had kissed her, Aladdin, her Aladdin said, "I beg of you, princess, in God's name, before we speak of anything else." For your own sake and mine, tell me what was have what was has become. Tell me what has become of an old lamb I left on the cornice in the hall in the hall of four and twenty windows when I went a hunting. Alas, she said, I am an I am the innocent cause of our sorrows, and told him the extents. Of the lamb. Now I know," cried Aladdin, "that we have to thank the African magician for this. Where is the lamb? He carries it about with him," said the princess. "I know, for he pulled it. I know, who for he pulled it out of his breast to show him to show me. He wishes me to break my faith with you and marry him." Saying that you were beheaded by my father's command, he is for ever speaking ill of you. But I only reply with my tears. If I persist, I doubt not. I doubt not. But he will use violence. Use violence. Aladdin comforted her and left her for a while. He changed clothes. With the first person he met in the town, and having bought a certain powder, returned to the princess. Returned to the princess, who led him in by a little side door. Put on your most beautiful dress, he said to her, 
and receive the magician with smiles, leading him to believe that you have forgotten me. Invite him to soup, to sup with you, and say you wish to taste the wine of his country. He will go for some, and while he's he is gone, I will tell you what to do. She listened carefully to Aladdin, and when he left, she arrayed herself gaily for the first time since left China. Since he left China, she put on a girdle and headdress. Of diamonds and seeing in a glass that she was more beautiful than ever, received the magician saying to his great amazement, "I have made up my mind that Aladdin is dead, and that all my tears will not bring him back to me. So, I, I am resolved to mourn no more, and have therefore invited you to sup with me, you to sup with me." But I'm tried of the wines of China, and would fain taste those of Africa. The magician flew to his cellar, and the princess put the powder. Aladdin had given her in her cup. When he returns, she asks him to drink her health in the wine of Africa, handing him her cup in exchange for his. As a sign, she was reconciled. Reconciled to him, before drinking, the magician made her speak a speech in praise of her beauty. But the princess cut him short, saying, "Let us drink first, and you shall say what you, what you still afterward." She set her cup to her lip, and kept it there. While the magician drained his to the dregs and fell back, lifeless. The princess then opened the door to Aladdin and flung her arms around his neck, but Aladdin put her away, bidding her leave him, as he had more to do. He then went to the dead magician, took the lamp out of his face, and bade the genie carry to the, the palace, the palace, and all it, it back to China. This was done. The, and the princess in chamber only felt two little sobs, and little thought she was at home again. The sultan, who was sitting in his closet, mourning for his lost daughter, happened to look up and rub and rubbed his eyes, for there stood the palace as before. He hastened thither, and Aladdin received him in the hall of the four and twenty windows, with the princess. At his side, Aladdin told him what had happened, and showed him the dead body of the magician, that he might believe a ten days feast was proclaimed, and it seems, and it seemed as if Aladdin might now live the rest of his life in peace, but it was not to be. The African had a younger brother who was, if possible. More wicked and more cunning than himself, he traveled to China to avenge his brother's death, and went to visit a, a fierce woman called Fatima, thinking she she might be of us of use to him. He entered her cell and clapped a dagger to her breast, telling her to rise and do his bidding on pain of death. He changed clothes with her, color his face like hers, put on her veil, and murder her, that she might tell no tales. Then he went toward the palace of Aladdin, and all the people, the people thinking he was the holy woman, gathered round him, kissing his hands and begging his blessing. When he got to the palace, that was such a noise going on around him. That the princess bade her slave look out of the window and ask, "What was the matter?" The slave said, "It was a holy woman, a holy woman, curing people by her touch of their ailments." Whereupon the princess, who had long desired to see Fatima, sent for her. On coming to the princess, the magician offered, 
offered up a prayer for her health and prosperity. When he had done, the princess met him sit by her and begged him to stay with her always. The false Fatima, who wished for nothing better, consent, consent but kept his fell down for a fear of discovery. The princess showed him the hall and asked him what he thought of it. It's truly beautiful, said the false Fatima. In my mind, it was, it wants but one thing. And what is that? said the princess. If only a broke egg, replied he. Where hung up from the middle of his dome, of this dome, it would be the wonder of the world. After this, the princess could think of nothing but the rogue's egg. And when Aladdin returned from the hunting, he found her in a very ill humor. He begged to know what was amiss, and she told him that all her pleasures in the hall was spoiled for the ones for the one of a rogue's hanging from the dome. If that is I, if that is all, replied Aladdin, you shall soon be happy. He left her and rubbed the lamp. And when the genie appeared, commanded him to bring rogues, a rogue's egg. The genie gave such a loud and terrible shirt that the whole shook. Fred, he cried, is it not enough that I have done everything for you? But you must command me to bring my master and hang him up in the midst of this dome. You and your wife and your palace deserve to be burned to others. But that this request does not come from you, but from the brother of the African magicians whom you destroyed. He is now in your palace disguised as the holy woman who he murdered. He it was who put the that wish into your wife's head. Take care of yourself, for he means to kill you. So saying, the genie disappeared. So saying, the genie disappeared. Aladdin went back to the princess, saying his headache, and requesting that the holy Fatima should be fetched to lay her hands on it. But when the magician came near, Aladdin, seizing his dagger, pierced him to the heart. What have you done? cried the princess. You have killed the holy woman. Not so, replied Aladdin, but a wicked magician, and told her of how she had been deceived. After this, Aladdin and his wife lived in a peace. In peace, he succeeded the sultan when he died, and reigned for many years, leaving behind him a long lines of kings. Part 3. Make a note, rattle the using story and word at penny. Information from the LU. Once upon a time, there were three bears who lived together in a house of their own in the wood. One of them was a little, small wee bear, one was a middle-sized bear, and the other was a great huge bear. One day, after they had made a porridge for their breakfast. They walked in, walked out into the wood while the porridge was cooling. And while they were walking, a little girl came into the house. This little girl, this little girl has golden curls that tumbled down her back to her waist, and everyone called her by Goldilocks. Goldilocks went inside. First, she tasted the porridge of the great huge bear, and that was far too hot for her. And then she tasted the porridge of the middle bear, and that was too cold for her. And then she went the porridge to the porridge of the little, small wee bear, and tasted that, and that was neither too hot and too cold, but just right. And she liked it so well. And that she ate it all up. Then Goldilocks went upstairs with into the bed chambers, and first she lay down upon the bed of the great huge bear, and then she lay down upon the bed of the middle bear, 
and finally she lay down upon the bed of the little small wee bear and that was just right so he covered herself comfort comfortably and lay there until she fell fast asleep by this time the three bears took their porridge would be cool enough so they came home to breakfast somebody has been at my porridge said the great kick bear in his great huge voice somebody has been at my porridge said the middle bear in his middle voice then the little small wee bear looked at his and there was the spoon in the porridge pot but the porridge was all gone somebody has been at my porridge and has eaten it all up said the little small wee bear in his little small wee voice then the three bears went upstairs into their bedroom somebody has been lying in my bed said the great huge bear in his great throat groove voice somebody has been lying in my bed said the middle bear in his middle voice and when the little small wee bear came to look at his bed upon the pillow there was a pool of golden curls and the angelic face of a little girl snoring away fast asleep somebody has been lying in my bed and here she is said the little small wee bear in his little small wee voice Goldilocks jumped off the bed and ran downstairs, out of the door and down the garden path. She ran and she ran until she reached the house of the grandmama. When she told her grandmama about the house of the three bears who lived in the in the wood, her granny said, "My, my, what a wild imagination you have, child." Thank you.